stocks, bonds, ETFs, straight out of downtown Chicago. This is Zach's Market Edge. Welcome to Zach's Market Edge, the podcast about investing in your life. I'm your host, Tracy Reinick, and this week I'm finally joined by someone on the podcast. Uh, With me is John Blank, Zach's chief equity strategist, although he's in California and I'm still in my dining room in Chicago. And this week we're going to discuss what is happening to the U.S. economy during this coronavirus crisis, what could the recovery look like? What's happening to the stocks? Uh, maybe some secret areas you might be wanting to consider looking into if you're thinking of jumping in here. And as you know, for those of you who've been listening over the last couple of years, uh, John and I have done many podcasts over, I want to say at least four years now, going over what a U.S. recession would look like. Is one coming? All of these issues about recessions and now here we are back again during this pandemic and I don't think we ever talked about a pandemic leading us to one except for some of our podcasts John earlier this year when it was already breaking out in China but prior to then we were never discussing pandemics so John the big question I just want to lead off with are we already in a recession Tracy, uh, I know you always said to look at that. Answer, yeah, I mean, I, I know you and, and our listeners and everybody else knows the obvious answer with a 20 percent unemployment rate is, yeah. is a recession. But let's let's stop before we go there. OK. Um, through March the 12th, which was the March payrolls that we got, we had a minus seven hundred one thousand print. 492,000 of those were, or 450,000 of those were restaurant workers who were furloughed, right? Yeah. So if we take it minus 250, minus 240 and minus 250 for just March, that's one month. And a recession in technical terms is two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth in revised terms. So the National Bureau of Economic Research cannot even think of this as a recession unless it gets from March, April, May, June, July, August. It can't even decide if it is one until September of this year. Okay. Now, why that matters, Tracy, is if I get to September of this year, What are the likelihood of the shutdowns in the U.S. economy being over? Pretty good. Probably 100%. Right. That's the answer that I was not fishing for, but I don't disagree with. Okay. Probably 100%. So then the question is, from those months from March to April to May to June, July, and August, do I have six months of negative GDP growth that'll be booked? Yes or no? I don't know. <laughs> it's yeah, the I don't know probably the right answer, but I think the probability <laughs> of it is pretty high. Okay. Yeah? So yes. this gets to the next thing. So we won't get a recession call officially until the fall. Okay. And But the real issue for the market which you've already alluded to, is the, the, the type of recession we are in. Because we've done co- podcasts for four years on predicting a what's called a cyclical recession, right? Right. right. Where there's excesses built in. Or in, in a more extreme situation, a structural recession when something has been done to the economy structurally like we saw in 08 09 where there was just too many mortgages issued that blew up the economy and we needed to do a big reform right. so the point is this recession amongst the three that you can have event driven the one we're in or likely in cyclical uh, one where the monetary policy experts blew it or we just have excesses in the financial system or structural, 
where the regulatory structure of the government or a war or some type of thing, it just completely caused disarray. Um, we're in the least of these things. And, and the record for these types of recessions, and I'm going to be very exact about this. I have this pulled up, Tracy. Okay. And what I'm going to say is the, 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 the event-driven recessions can end in nine months on average. Okay, that sounds good. Right, so again, do the math. If we start the recession in March now, when does it end, typically? Uh, right at the end of the year then. Right at the end of the year, right at the end of the year. So the likely average scenario in all of our minds should be that, yes, we are going to see the NBER call this a recession starting in March of 2020, and the average length of something like this will extend three quarters and end at the end of this year. Um, and now one of the implications here is we're going to enter a November presidential election in the third quarter of that average recession. Yeah. Um, now, that is another real fly in the ointment because how does a ruling party uh, handle a recession year in terms of turnout, in terms of delivery to the media, in terms of trying to stimulate the economy or the stock market. Um, and that that's the other part of the situation is the CARES Act, what's called the CARES Act, C-A-R-E-S, Coronavirus Assistance Relief and Economic Stabilization Act, which spells out CARES. CARES Act. Now, the CARES Act is designed, Tracy, on the model that we are in an event-driven recession. Right. Right? Yeah. But it's also serving um, what's called a political business cycle, because it's going to be stimulus that's going to come in front of that election in the midst of this recession. Right? Right. And so this is the context we're operating in. I think it's very hard for me not to say this is an event-driven recession. I, I can't argue with that. With 20% unemployment, even when you re recover, U.S. conference board statistics put the overall unemployment rate for 2020 at 8.5%, which means, you know, if we're going to get to 20 25% in these furloughs, we're going to get two-thirds of the people back this year. But... You know, have five percent of the people who you know, we had a three and a half percent unemployment rate. We're going to throw another five percent of people. Now, how many people does that make? Uh, let's do 150 million in the civilian labor force. That makes another a one and a half is 1.5 million is one percent. So do do five percent of that. That's yeah. seven million people right. in the United States that are workers who will be unemployed in the fall relative to now. Right. Um, so that, yep. that, what do you think about that? I'll throw that back at you. Well, that's going to have a lot of, you know, implications to our consumer driven economy, obviously. That's yeah. how I'm looking at it. What else though? Where, where do you go with this in terms of the stock investor? Well, that's the thing. Um, right now, everybody's going into the consumer-driven economy. <laughs> um, and I don't think that's necessarily the place to go. But I feel like they probably maybe will do some other kind of stimulus, whether or not it's, you know, an infrastructure. They, they're looking at the payroll tax cut again. All of that is going to play into it, too. Because if we get an infrastructure, that is going to be interesting i'm not sure where they'll find the employees to to do an infrastructure bill though here because the ones they're laying off aren't the ones who are going to be able to go out and build the bridge necessarily yeah i mean i'll tell you what i did some work actually with lens x uh, earlier this well past few days and and one of the things he asked me to look into is is you know coronavirus trends and the types of stocks that would work in a coronavirus environment. And I'll throw out some stuff, more facts for you, Tracy, to think about. First of all, 2020 
annual earnings at this point in time in late March, the top three sectors in terms of earnings growth are Infotech, which is going to get 7% year-on-year growth, even with this going on. Healthcare, which is getting 5.8% year-on-year growth. Obviously, the healthcare system is going to be fine in the midst of this. Right. Communication services, because we're all basically sitting at home, 4.7% year-on-year. And yes, consumer staples is 3.1%. you got to remember all the grocery guys are in there. Right. On real estate and utilities aren't going to be that bad. So healthcare, communication services, staples, real estate and utilities, not going to be that bad. But here's where the interesting stock market um, story is, and I, I'm kind of curious more of what your answer to this is than, than anybody really, Tracy, as, as value investor kind of editor, is the 2021 earnings, which will the market will price probably by midsummer. I have energy plus 78, industrials plus 29, consumer discretionary plus 24, materials plus 18, Infotech plus 14, communication services plus 14, healthcare plus 10, financials plus 9, and staples just plus 7. So a massive cyclical bounce in the data that's out there nine months from now. So what do you do as an investor with first the 2020 numbers, which are healthcare and communication services and telco are, are and infotech related, and then this idea that there's a big, huge double-digit run and all these other things? Well, people are already piling into some of the industrials. That's why we're seeing like Caterpillar and whatnot starting to take off here. And energy is up on its lows too. So, but I mean, they've still been beaten down. So it's not, you know, it's not too late to get into some of these. But I mean, there's been a big move in uh, equipment in United Rentals and H&E equipment. Both of those have made runs. And so neither one of those are altogether, you know, really cheap here either. But a lot of those are going to be plays if it, the scenarios you paint out turns out to be true with industrials, yeah. energy, materials. And even consumer discretionary, 25% pop. I mean, this yeah. is the thing people got to understand. I was looking this morning doing the uh, Zach's Market Strategy Report and the JP Morgan Global PMI for manufacturing was almost 50 and rose this month. Yeah. Because of the weight that China plays in the manufacturing economy of the world. Right. It actually rose. So yeah. this is something people need to understand. I mean, you can be smart and buy energy. You can be smart and buy industrials and materials now, and I will not think you're stupid. Okay. <laughs> right? Yeah. Because you're just you're just saying, look, I I get it. <laughs> yeah. Well, even on, on energy, as bad as that demand destruction is going to be, and you know, we keep hearing these stories about all the smaller EMPs are gonna go bankrupt. Well, some of the big boys will not. So if you buy strength, you know, that's where you want to be. You want to buy the strength in any of these areas. You don't want to buy the ones that were in trouble going into this. You want to buy the ones that, you know, have the brands and have the balance sheet strength to survive. Yeah, you want to play these cyclical names now but you only want to play the very high quality ones because you don't want to buy stuff with real problems. Right. And you don't want to buy stuff. And I'm your head the same. You don't want to buy stuff where, you know, the baby goes, you know, the water goes out and the guys swimming naked, as they say. Right. For sure. Right. So you so, buy, I mean, but this is where the, the real smart investor looks and say, like you're saying, big energy conglomerate. Yeah. Big industrial, you know, companies that have major footprints, strong consumer discretionary stocks, very good, well-placed material companies, strong infotech numbers, right? I mean, there. This is going to be like the sleeper way, right? Yeah. And this is what people don't understand: is you don't, you don't get the perfect world where these guys are hitting on all cylinders and they're cheap. That's not how it works. Right. You wake up. And you go in, you know, to the red light district with 20 bucks and see what you get. 
<laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, it's going to be grim. And you don't have enough money, but you got to make a good call and just do it, you know? Yeah. And so, this is the thing. We're, we're in a very hairy, panic-driven environment. A lot of volatility. A lot of things been shot. But at the end of the day, you know, you just got to, you know, close your eyes and make some very good calls. But like you're saying, on big, strong names, do not try to be a genius on, on picking a smaller company right now. Yeah, I've, I've used I've used your advice on that several times in the latest podcasts. I've been telling people, um, you know, to not be a genius, because I think that's very good advice in this kind of market conditions. But switching over a little bit, what do you think about the housing sector? You didn't bring them up at all when you were just laying out the different groups. And I feel like it does get overlooked because of what happened in 2008, 2009. It was not a driver coming out of that recession. Obviously, it caused, basically, it almost caused that recession. And then it took years to even, you know, hit a bottom, then come out. And then for the most part, people have been ignoring it the last several years, even though it's been a hot area, at least on the home builder side, home renovations, all of that has has been strong, but it is about 15, I saw some estimates, 15 to 18% of GDP is housing related. And what do you think about housing here? And maybe that could be a driver going into 2021 coming out of this recession as well. Absolutely, Tracy. I mean, just to give people an understanding here, I'm looking at the Fred Economic Research Housing Starts, total new privately owned. Yeah, uh, it, it was around 1.2 million for 2015 to 2020 for five years, and in January it popped to 1.6 million, 400,000, a 25 percent pop in the early part of this year, right? Yeah, it's to be really heating up in January and February. Like I've seen some uh, city-specific data, like even here in Chicago, house sales. Uh, were super strong in the first two months. And then even into March, when the virus was already, you know, over here in the United States, we hadn't shut down yet here in Illinois. But the first two weeks of March were super strong. And then it slowed in the second two weeks. But it was enough to make uh, March 2020 have higher sales than March 2019, even with the shutdown. Yeah, so, I mean, I'll read it. the February 18th U.S. Census Bureau and Housing and Urban Development reported that we had a seasonally adjusted annual rate of 1.6 million units in February, which is what I said. Yeah. Yeah. So the thing I've learned is uh, from Zillow, who has done you know some work on you know real estate listings during crises and whatnot, is yeah. and China has a good model. They've already know what happens in places like this. First of all. Yes, everything goes to pieces and nobody looks, of course. Right. Right. But that's telling something obvious that's not helpful. What was helpful was when it is over, eventually, when it is over, eventually, which our, again, language is about when is probably the fall at best. Yeah. Things usually pick up where they left off. Right. Um. Yeah. At least for those who, you know, stayed in their jobs or reclaimed their jobs, that kind of right. thing. Right. And so, see, this is the puzzle. Again, housing stocks, I'm sure, are beaten to pieces. They are. I took a look at a couple of them. Uh, they have bounced again off the lows They uh, from March, but they tried to test it again. But like KB Home, for instance, ticker KBH, that's down 40% year to date now. It's P is just six times. Yeah, so so they all have to hammer in six, any recession they can hammer. But yeah. again, as a stock buyer, not a buy stock seller, um, I wouldn't be right on top of these guys because it, it could be a few. You know, I think this is one of these areas where I would be a little patient for a few months, but I would be watching them um, on the first indication that shutdowns have probably be a little late but if you just want to wait for the trend to build and see it get moving as a stock per se you gotta yeah. wonder if some there's a play that's going to happen there right what, yeah. what do you think about like a home depot on the retail side with people you know we're all stuck in our houses now and right. 
maybe we're looking at like that kitchen and we're like, ew, I always wanted to renovate it. Now I'm stuck with it for, you know, maybe even like six weeks to eight weeks here. And once this is over, I'm going to go to Home Depot and I'm, I'm renovating that thing. I'm, I'm making it nicer. I'm getting the new kitchen I wanted. What about a stock like that or like a consumer response like that? Yeah, I think I'm with you. You know, I'll tell you what, I had a medical, I had a dental emergency. I had to get on the road to L.A. last, just yesterday. Wow. And you know, I stay at home, right? Yeah. So I thought, oh, oh, I'll get down there in no product time, you know, and I did. Uh, it yeah. was quick. But what I learned was it wasn't as empty as I thought it was going to be. Okay, interesting. Yeah, and this is what I wanted to talk about. What I did see, like um, I would say, honestly, Tracy, half the cars were not cars. They were termite control, you know, water, uh, sewage, painters, you know, gardeners. What people were doing is getting errands done around the house. Right. Right? Yeah. So I'm sitting around and I finally, like you're saying, I'm already dealing with the fixing the sink. I'm going to get the, the garden ready to go for the spring. I'm, right. I'm bored. Yeah. And so I think there is some credence to the idea that there will be discussions that surround um, updating. And I do not think it will wait for the shutdowns. They may have people just deliver the stuff and start in their house, right? Hobbying. And stuff and then moving into more bigger things so i think it, that is valid and i think it will ha it's already probably happening yeah and i've you, already my indication of the road is i'll just tell you right now i mean everybody's not sitting around doing nothing they're calling people right right i've already heard uh from up here in chicago from some chemical companies that uh paint is selling like hotcakes at all the yeah. stores right so, yeah, you yeah. call Phil and William up and do a, you got bored, so you fix your bedroom finally. Right. Yeah. yeah. Makes sense. I mean, I get it, right? It does. And we just got the news from Wayfair, um, ticker W, for those who don't know. You know, they sell a lot of items I feel like you might buy for your stay-at-home office. Um, right. That kind of thing, like desks and lamps and things that you can have them ship real quick. And sales doubled. Um, during, you know, the worst of the shutdown into this first quarter for them. And they saw higher than expected revenue growth. But, you know, we don't know how long that's going to last at some of these places. But you can't, you know, or you're trying to shelter at home. So you're not going to go to the Target to buy the desk. You're just going to go on Wayfair and have them deliver it to you. Yeah. Yeah. You know? yeah. Here, I'll tell you what. I, here's, my, here's my top industry sectors. And I rank them uh, top to bottom, I'll just give them out to people. First, number one, I think you got to like semiconductor, semi-equipment, and computer storage devices because of the remote working situation. Okay, that makes sense. Do you agree with that? I do, yeah. Okay. Number two, I like consumer, computer software, computer mini computers, I like computer services, and I like tech services because I think if you like semis, you got to like all the stuff that you know basically gets built into them, right? Sure, yeah. Okay, number three, I like internet software. I like internet services. I like internet commerce. Okay. Number four, I like electronics, miscellaneous, computer optical imaging, and fiber optics, right? Sure, yeah. I mean, these are the four things. I mean, look, we're all sitting around at home. We know that the 2020 consistent with 2021 and 2020 is 7% growth in Infotech and 14% next year. At the end of the day, the safest and most coherent play is to figure out something that's tech related, that's cheaper. Yes. Right? Yes. Uh, that's just kind of my thinking. So now I get further down, I get a little more hair on the ball. You know, I get more hair on these ideas. For example, containers, retail convenience stores, natural foods. So yeah, we know this is working. Right. Uh, how long is it going to work, right? I don't know. That's like that area makes me a little nervous because sure we all raced out, we bought the Campbell soup, but right. you know, 3 or 4 months from now I feel like we're going to be pretty sick of that Campbell soup and I don't think we're going to be yeah. buying it anymore. That's it. So then another one I don't necessarily like, I got on my list, but I I'm, I'm in the same camp because it's too transient 
is audio, video production, online gaming, toys and hobbies, cable TV. The idea that we're all going to sit at home forever, I think you're right. It's going to be the total opposite when this is over. Yeah, so you're going to cancel the Disney Plus, maybe? Yeah, it's not. I mean, by the end of this thing, you're going to see everything on Disney Plus. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, that is a possibility, right? Right. I mean, it, you know, yeah, I think people are looking for the play and audio and video production. Uh, have to think a lot harder about it because I think, you know, another thing that's going to happen is sport, sports starvation. You know, there's no sports to be watched right now. So then there'll be sports starvation and people want to see stuff. Maybe they want to see it in purpose. I don't know. I mean, maybe there's a huge ticket boom in the fall. Well, that's another another area that I feel like, um, you know, the experiences side. But how do you invest in that? Because you know, you, you don't really want to buy IMAX here, I don't think either, or, you know, AMC or one of those kinds of experiences. But do you buy the hotels? I don't know. I mean, they're going to reopen. People are going to want to travel again. And I saw an interesting stat because China just had a three-day holiday weekend. And not all of their uh, cities are open. Wuhan is finally opening this week. But most of, you know, Beijing's been open, Shanghai, the big, the bigger, other bigger cities have been open for two to three weeks now. And so how many of those people were willing to travel over their three day holiday weekend? And it wasn't, it was more than I thought. I was surprised, like the number of people who bought train tickets and the, the number who did go to hotels. And that's a good sign, I feel, for what may happen in the U.S. and, you know, the rest of the world, basically, into Europe, is that it hasn't been that long. And yet they're still willing to be like, hey, I got to get out of my apartment and I'm, I'm going on that train somewhere for three days. Yeah. So, yeah, that's I'm not surprised. I, you know, again, I mean, if you think about it from a coronavirus perspective, actually, you can get a little more pessimistic and close to closed environments where people can you know, maybe restaurants where there's too close to seating. Right. But maybe, maybe what happens is they open them up and you really sit far apart for the first two months, right? Yeah. And then the hotels, I mean, again, if I know you ramp up the cleaning of the rooms and the particular right. the bathrooms and you wipe the knobs and the doors and let me know about that, at least I'm isolated from everybody else when I come and go. You can make yeah. a hotel work out for me. Right. So what's going to happen is they're both going to reopen under rules that are very different for a period of time, no matter what, anyways. Yes. So you're going to go in that, you know, at the capacity of the restaurant was 300 people, it'll be allowed 150 people. Yeah. With empty chairs between, you know, people. And hotels will be were offered as long as you double the amount of cleaning going on on the doorknobs and whatnot, sanitation things, right? Right. And then, you know, the thing you get a little more pessimistic about is the big bets. You know, how do you start the NBA? Do you just open half the tickets so people don't have to sit right through each other? I don't know. Well, stuff like or that. Or you, you say, hey, you know what, we're going to start playing games and we make most of our money on video anyway, so we're just not going to open the stadiums up. Right. Yeah. See, I think that we're going to get to this that, that world. We're going to get to opening all sports, but nobody's going to show up for a while. Right. Because I don't see, for example, let's take the new stadium in L.A. opens in July for Taylor Swift. Really? In July? That's not going to happen. 80,000 people in a new stadium? No. Really? I mean, I just don't think so. Right. These are the things that are not going to come back. You know, no, because you're going to go, look, I'll go to Taylor Swift. I'll watch video. I'll, I want to see the show. But yeah. I don't want to go with 80,000 screaming, coughing people. Right. Um, so this is a real problem and there's going to be a lot of rethinking of how to stage these events because the, the events will want to be staged yeah. um, and people will try to figure out whether they checkerboard the stadium. You know what I mean? Like literally checkerboard it. Right. Black and white little checks and the black is where people sit and the white is not. And so they can get support. You know, you can basically, maybe you test everybody before they go in. Right, you yeah. want to go with Taylor Swift? You show up to have a few free drinks and get tested in five minutes. Yeah, I mean, I can really see like, okay, we're going to do Taylor Swift in July. 
but there's going to be a pre-party, a testing pre-party, and if you don't get, you don't get in unless you, you do it, right? But we're a long way from that still. I doubt it, man. I, I think the way this thing opens is super-duper testing, contact tracing for anybody who comes out positive and isolation for those groups. And yeah. they actually do open it up, and then they say, hey, hey, it's like, it's like inviting a, a mouse into a trap. They're going to say Taylor Swift's open, and they're going to do 85,000 tests of everybody and, and ping out the 500 people that have this thing. Yeah. And they, hey, they'll say, hey, you know, we're sure the rest of you guys are fine. Go ahead. But we're, now we got these other 500. They're the, they're the mouse that ate the cheese. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's how you do it. You know what I mean? So I, mean I, think, I think you got to start realizing um, – how testing will work to get things open will interact with this very dramatically. And the, the intermediate stage in the fall will have this interregnum where testing is part of your life. Yeah. But it sounds like you're kind of bullish here about, you know, stocks and the recovery. I am. The thing I don't like, um, and I've seen a lot of people do technical analysis on the 20s and the 30s and how big the pullback was and whatnot. The very problem with that, going back to the early part of our conversation, is that is pasting, and I mean pasting, pasting charts that are event-driven phenomena on structural and cyclical recessions that were much different in character, right? Right, for sure. And this is where, I mean, just let's, for example, I did this morning for TD Ameritrade. I did this for Johns Hopkins coronavirus, right? Yeah. Just, just to show you how we have to think about this and how you can get bullish. Spain has 140,000 cases. Italy has 135,000 cases. And Germany has 105,000 cases, right? Right. I'm looking at the data right on the screen right now. Now, here's what's interesting. Italy with 135,000 cases has 17,000 deaths. So 15% of the people who get it are dead there. Right. Spain has 14,000 deaths for 140,000, 10% death rate in Spain. Now get to Germany, 1,900 out of 100,000, so 2%, right? Right, right. So what this tells you, is not a future scenario. What this tells you, Tracy, is that today, in parts of the states, the United States, and in parts of Europe, and in parts of Asia, particularly South Korea, it is about the management effectiveness of your healthcare regime. And right. some places are doing just fine. Yeah, yeah. And I'm not talking about the future. I'm talking right now. So what's going to happen is, like, for example, California cases per population, we're at the, like, the Wyoming level, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're not even, you guys in Chicago are, like, triple us. Yeah. And why is that? Well, we're just, we got our game on. We got a lot of tech companies where it's more spread out. You know, the people, the mojo is in play. Nobody's doping around. We're taking it seriously. Our government works, right? Yeah. Yeah. So this is the thing people are going to realize, ah, you know what? It's just about not the data, not the macroeconomics. It's about management effectiveness. Yeah. Both public and private. So that's where we're seeing, you know, this uh, mini rally again that we're having. Yeah. In All you got to think about is realizing we're not going to be dopes and we can do this and it's going to work. Yeah. And now, now look at, let's go to New York City uh, you know, classic mistakes, right? They're almost at 1% infection rates. It's close to 1% of the population. Yeah. It's been tested positive. One out of 100. Uh, now that, you say to yourself, see, this is where you get bearish. You say, oh my God. You know, and it spread to D.C. and New Jersey and Connecticut and New England and Boston in particular. They're all basically stuck with this thing at much higher levels. So John Blank decided to go see his friends in Boston in the fall? No. No, he doesn't. No. Does Tracy go to see her friends in New York? No. No, she doesn't. Right. 
So this is the problem in the United States context. Spain, Italy, and New York City are dead on arrival for much longer than people realize. Yeah. But unless they get their management effectiveness up. Right. And see, this is the thing I, I, I'm trying to turn people's minds to is this is not about, you know, you know, the latest Thursday, you know, weekly unemployment claims are going to 20%. It's not about this credible story of how long or deep the recession is. It's about getting our management effectiveness in place so we can move forward. And we know that places work. I mean, for example, if I were running the U.S. federal public health emergency team, I would have already had at least a thousand people in situ in South Korea learning absolutely everything about what they are doing and doing it exactly the same here. Yeah. And I would just take all that stimulus money and say, look, just pay the South Koreans for every testing, every contact tracing, every methodology, have all these people walk through the thing and get that regime in place now, quickly, and scale it. This right. is where we need to go. We need to realize public and private sector effectiveness are the way out. Right. And if we get that right, man, you can wrap this up quick. I mean, South Korea, let's do South Korea, Tracy. 10,000 infections right, right now. Country of 60 million people has stopped, and I'll take a look at their chart. Yeah, it's, it's, they used to be at 8,000, you know, mid February, they're at 10,000 now. So they've had 2,000 cases in the last month and a half. Right. 192 deaths out of 10,000 people, 2%. This is very typical. Germany and, and South Korea are at 2% death rates. That's top of the game. United States, 379,000, 11,000 deaths. Not bad. I mean, we are, again, that 1% you know, would be 3,700. So we're about 2.5%, right? Yeah. And what do you find? I mean, if you're in Chicago, Detroit, Louisiana, Michigan, anywhere, Los Angeles, it's the minority groups that are getting higher death rates. Um, so there also is a poverty income inequality. Um, it may, may even be genetic, uh, element to this thing. Um, but at the end of the day, when you look at the United States, 379 with 11, what that tells you is our healthcare effectiveness is pretty good and pretty close to Germany and South Korea now. Well, right? again, this, it's from these numbers because we're not going up to 100,000, at least not yet, that the market is rallying on. Right, yeah, I mean, you get daily increase out of the United States and we are now on our second day. You know, today was 29.5, Lester was 28.2, the high was on the third at 33. Yeah, so we're down off the highs of 33,000 a day, right? Right. Um, but see, again, how, okay, we go down, 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 but how do we get to open things that's certainly the start of it, but the next start of it is then to start weeding these folk out and keeping them out of the rest of us. Right. Right. Yeah, but that's all going to take a while. That's going to take a while. That's the thing about management effectiveness. The way to get out of this is not like, oh, hey, we're getting, we're done. It's not going to happen. It's going to be okay in Streeterville. There's now testing regimes. And if you agree to get tested, you can go to the bars now. Yeah. Right? So for investors, they really should, um, you know, not think that whatever rally we're getting right here is going to be the rally. <laughs> or if we get another sell-off, that's going to be the sell-off. Because yeah. this, is, this is a multi-month, you know, to the end of the year scenario that's playing out. Yes, and I think people's, you know, is the bottom in or not? Are we going to retest? Get rid of that mentality because it's not helpful. We're in an unprecedented event-driven situation. Right. It's likely not an analog. And even if you take one like the Spanish flu, 
you don't, you know, that was a time when there was a war going on and trench yeah. warfare was creating the problems in the wave. And we didn't have supercomputers and we didn't have testing and we didn't know what was going on. Right. It's not helpful. Right, right. No, I, I agree mean, with that. The, the real struggle here is people realize we need to be aware that even if the public health regime gets extended for an additional month, if that means it's entailing the investment of a really effective treatment regime while we get we need four or more weeks to do it, then we clap our hands. Yeah. But if it means four more weeks because we're dopes and we don't know what we're doing, it's not going to help anyways. <laughs> right. This is where I've come to. I've realized it's really about the effectiveness, Tracy. We have to, we have to get the time in place, keep the, the health systems under less stress so they can, they can quickly mutate into this scalable, effective enterprise that can get us out of this thing. Yeah. No, that's key for sure. Yeah. Okay. The thing about we only have been on this thing a month. I mean, if you realize how phenomenal it is to have this thing thrown at us in a month later to have toppled the peak, yeah, let's give ourselves credit. That's good. That's good work. Yeah. 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 Uh, it seems longer than a month. <laughs> right. It does. And right. it's been really hairy and really confusing, but um, I'm impressed, at least out here, yeah, but we've always been a good, we're a heads up state, but I'll tell you out here, we got the memo, you know, and we read it. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay. I don't know about Chicago, look in your numbers. I think everybody got the memo, but in the poor neighborhoods, they didn't read it. Um, no, it's pretty much shut down, but you know, it was already circulating here by the time right. we shut down. So, you know, there's only so much you can do there, but, but yeah, no, uh, we were among the, the early states to shut everything down. So we'll see if that helps us. I hope so. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So I guess I have to have you on again in a couple more weeks. <laughs> this is our, this is our new MO. It seems like to see where we stand, you know, hopefully the next time I have you on, then we will be coming out of the shutdowns and all of that. And then we can discuss again, what things look like and you know if there's been another stimulus and all of that will have occurred i'm sure by then so yeah this this will be interesting going forward yeah that's it we just got to do more regular updates and learn that this is about something we can learn about and continue to learn about it and then the more we learn about it, the more we can leverage that knowledge and, and make money in stocks yeah Okay, and speaking of stocks, we talked about a couple of them here on the episode. We talked about Home Depot, ticker HD. Uh, you got to like them. They were great going into this whole event. And now I guess we're all going to garden and re renovate our kitchens. So <laughs> might want to buy it again. Um, it has come down a little bit off of its highs. Still trading around 19 times right here. So not altogether cheap, but you're playing uh, their strength here. KB Homes, I mentioned them, KBH, they're cheap at just under seven times here, but those shares really pulled back. A couple of the other big home builders, uh, Pulte, PHM, Lenar, L-E-N, might want to take a look at all of them. They're all cheap here. I mentioned United Rentals, URI, they have some exposure to energy, so if you think that energy prediction going into next year that that could be a hot area they have a little bit it's like five percent of revenue always has been energy for them with the pumps and whatnot um but that's ticker uri i think i mentioned um h and e equipment that's a smaller rental equipment player h e e s is the ticker there and then i mentioned caterpillar but i don't know exactly what's going on there with them but always ticker is c-a-t and then we talked about Wayfair a bit. They saw the big gain in sales, still not profitable, and the cash flow is still horrible there. But that's ticker W if you're interested in there. And a lot of the analysts aren't sure these sales are going to hold for them if they weren't just pulled forward and then they're just going to kind of evaporate when we can go back out shopping in the malls and whatnot. So Wayfair W. We mentioned Disney Plus. Um, but not in a good way, but ticker DIS, those shares have pulled back quite a bit as well. But the parks, which is 25% of revenue still shut down, even over in China, that's the thing that really has to be watched with a lot of these big entertainment companies. 
Same thing with um, Cedar Fair, fun is the ticker there, and um, any of the movie theater chain companies, uh, unclear when they're going to be able to reopen. So that's key for them. But as always, we're going to continue watching everything here at Zach's. And now that we can do these more remote podcasts with everybody in their own location, um, that gives us a lot more options. So be sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode here on the Market Edge. We're on SoundCloud. You can get us on Apple and we're on Spotify, but get us somewhere and I'll see you again next week with some more stocks. This material is being provided for informational purposes only and nothing herein constitutes investment, legal, accounting, or tax advice or a recommendation to buy, sell, or hold a security. Do not act or rely upon the information and advice given in this podcast without seeking the services of competent and professional legal, tax, or accounting counsel. Publication and distribution of this podcast is not intended to create and the information contained herein does not constitute an attorney-client relationship. No recommendation or advice is being given as to whether any investment or strategy is suitable for a particular investor. It should not be assumed that any investments in securities, companies, sectors, or markets identify and described were or will be profitable. All information is current as of the date herein and is subject to change without notice. Any views or opinions expressed may not reflect those of Zach's investment research as a whole.